Hi, I'm Jerry Gerard, and I'm not immortal, but neither are you. Hey, it's Jerry. Every time I sit down to do this or to write a blog post, I always feel like a little bit of a fraud. So everybody else has done this. There's nothing that you're adding to the universe that's impressive or different or helpful. You're just basically copying people. It's a little depressing, but one of the things I've kind of committed to is pushing through that. And I find out that when I talk to people and when I look in kind of popular business literature, it's not an uncommon feeling. I think I see there's a name for it. It's called imposter syndrome. And imposter syndrome is really pervasive when I've been actually kind of informally canvassing people I work with and people I know socially. It's interesting because from the outside, you look at people and go, wow, they really got it all figured out. Or man, that was an amazing way to put that sentence together. Or that was a really amazing way to write that lyric. And so you're constantly amazed at the ingenuity of others, but you think that literally it's not that kind of creativity is not open to you. And you put yourself, you take yourself out of the game just because you're not, you don't feel that you are worthy of entering the game. You know, I'm not good enough to be on the team, just to butcher that metaphor. I I can think of no better example than this specific song I heard in a, a relatively obscure Broadway show called Title of Show. And I love this show. My My oldest daughter, Katie, kind of turned me on to a lot of Broadway stuff and I've become quite a fan over the years but this specific song just embodies it so well so I wanted to play you a couple of pieces of this song You have a story to tell a novel you keep in a drawer Old sock drawer You have a painting to paint but you're lazy like an old French whore Just we whore You have a movie to make, shrinky dinks you can bake, but you best grab a steak, cause in sweep the vampires in, creep the vampires knee deep in vampires, filling you with doubt, insecurity about what your art should be in, sweep the vampires, die vampire. So the song is both insightful and hilarious. And then later in the song is the, the real kind of, the gotcha verse where it really gets... It really kind of, they kind of bring it home for me. The last vampire is the mother of all vampires, and that is the vampire of despair. It'll wake you up at 4 a.m. to say things like, Who do you think you're kidding? You look like a fool. No matter how hard you try, you'll never be good enough. Why is it if some dude walked up to me on the subway platform and said these things, I would think he was a mentally ill asshole. But if the vampire inside my head says it, it's the voice of reason. Man, if that's not, if that doesn't ring true for you, I know it does for me. I think, I think we have no greater enemy than the voice in our own heads sometimes. And there's a, another book that I've, I read a long time ago, but I'm actually rereading now very slowly, is a book by Stephen Pressfield called The War of Art. He actually gives this voice in your head a name. He calls it the resistance. And he explains in many different vignettes how the resistance is set up to stop you from taking that chance and stop you from stop you from asking for that raise or introducing yourself to that that man or woman that you find attractive across the room because you don't want to look stupid and you're and you're just gonna fail. That's just silly. I mean if you you, you really have to why be alive if you're not going to put yourself out there and, and live live fully? Why put a gate in front of yourself at every turn just to be, just to play it safe, just to make sure that we don't possibly fail or look stupid? It just seems like such a self-limiting waste. My guest today is Quinn Peterson. K-W-I-N, Quinn Peterson. We'll talk about the origin of that name and I think you'll find, like I found, that Quinn is full of insights and full of optimism and just really fun to listen to. So here's Quinn. 
And we all do. I don't want to, I don't want to be that guy. I'm so busy and nobody else is. <laughs> um, so, so I always start this the same way as you're probably aware. So I have to ask you, are you going to die? Okay, so I have a running joke. When people ask me that, I say, no, people I plan to People ask you that? <laughs> you know, yes, they do ask me that. Well, <laughs> we have interesting conversations in the lunchroom, and I joke that, you know, I plan to live forever, and so far, so good. <laughs> but the only reason, of course, that that's funny is because it's not true. We are all going to die. So in answer to your question, yes, I am going to die. Yeah, this has not been a very uh, suspenseful question, I find. <laughs> people, people, generally speaking, have, uh, have answered it in universally the same way. But uh, much as we may like to, for the contrary to be true, given the fact that that's, that's a given, given the fact that that's a given, do you find that it finds its way into your conscious thought every day, every month, every year? You know, it is... It's interesting. I am from a religious tradition. I grew up in it. Uh, parents, grandparents, back, 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 back in the tradition of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. So it's kind of like water to me. And I live here in Utah in the center of it all. And it's just around you all the time. This idea of you are going to die. That's part of the deal. It's a necessary part. It's a desirable part. There's nothing weird about it. It's as much a part of your progression as graduation from high school is. And you go to funerals around here, and sometimes that's what it feels like. It wasn't until you invited me onto this podcast that I started to think about how that looks maybe from the outside, because it's something that I rarely stop to question. You know, where does this what do I think about this? Very rarely does it come up. Only when I go to a funeral, for instance, outside of this tradition. I remember the first one I went to, I'm looking around going, what is going on here? This makes no sense. Uh, but yeah, it, it's so deeply ingrained that it's something I think about probably every day. Uh, and yet it's just part of breathing. So, so that's actually a very interesting viewpoint because a lot of people I think that I come in contact with are not necessarily thinking much about any life after the physical one we have here. A lot of people get a little, you know, scarcity kind of get a scarcity mindset because you know there's a clock and it's ticking down. And given the fact that you have this faith tradition, does that take some of that scarcity pressure off? Do you find? Okay, so you would think it does. But it doesn't. It just kind of, I guess, advances the clock a little bit. There is no scarcity of life because, you know, it's, it's accepted this is going to end. And by the way, in our religion, it's also temporary. But that doesn't help pay the bills in this moment. So all of the usual stuff that affects everybody else in real life, day-to-day -day living, affects me and my neighbors as well. So there are some people who have the abundance mindset and there are some who have a fixed mindset. And you see the whole range of that within the context of what we around here, I guess, call temporal living. Um, and it's something that you wouldn't think there's anything unusual going on here. It's, it's the same as everywhere else. Sure. Because even though, you know, no matter what you believe happens after we die here, you know, there's still there's still a sense of people wanting to get some goals met or making just making a mark and things like that. I think we've discovered in our prior conversations that we're basically exactly the same age. Yeah. So do you find uh, any truth to the, this, the kind of the midlife crisis thing where you basically people start to get closer to the statistical end of their life and start to make, get a little stir crazy or dramatic. Have you experienced anything like that yourself? I haven't experienced that. Or maybe I've been experiencing a midlife crisis since I was 16. It's been going on for so long that this might actually just be normal. One thing I have noticed is that I have a term life insurance policy that terms out at 55. And that has become very real to me in the last year. So there's a certain sense of urgency to get things put in order in the next five years. I guess that's as close as I've gotten to the midlife crisis. 
I haven't gone out and had a car and I don't have a tan and I don't yet, yet, yet have a six pack. Uh, so <laughs> I don't see any it, visible it tattoos. So I don't see no. anything. No, uh, no crazy hairstyles, that kind of thing. I think we're both 50. Is that right? I actually just turned 51. That's, I won't, no, no, now people will know. I can edit that. Yeah, out. yeah. <laughs> but my point is, uh, do you find that um, at this point in your life, there are things where you think about your life leading up to now and say, I wish I had done X differently, or if I could go back and tell myself X or Y, this is what I would tell, tell younger Quinn? You know, it's, it's interesting. You and I are both graduates of the Alt MBA. And when I went into the Alt MBA, uh, they when somebody asked, what do you want to get out of this? And I look back at my life and I see I've had so many different careers and none of them have meshed together. So I've got this dot and this dot and this dot and this dot, and they don't connect in any way. So that's what I'm looking back at. Uh, I wrote in my Alt-MBA thing that I'm just hoping to connect the dots at some point. And I think it was Steve Jobs who said, you can only look, connect them going backwards. And I'm hoping that maybe at the age of 51 and using the stuff that we have been learning lately, I can connect those dots looking backwards. And some of them are actually starting to coalesce. There's, there's starting to be some, some connections there. That's, that's really interesting. But yeah, looking back, I have so much advice that I would give to myself <laughs> and I'm sure I wouldn't have taken it because probably people were giving it to me anyway. And I didn't take it then. And I'm still, I would still be the dumb kid. And I, and now I'm the old man giving the dumb advice. So eh, it's not going to happen. Yeah. I find, um, I find myself torn because on some, some levels, I think I wasted a tremendous amount of physical time, hours and hours and hours of, I was talking to another um, gentleman who was saying that every time you rewatch a movie, that you've already seen just because you enjoy it or you like, like all those specific lines, that's basically wasteful. And I'm like, man, I've done that a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Certain movies I'll go back to over and over again just for the sheer enjoyment. But on the other hand, I've also read that people say that all that downtime is actually where the magic happens. So the ideas and the things that make you you don't happen during the time that you've basically calendared it in thing for an hour or two hours. Do you have any thoughts about wasted time or is that, is, there, is that such a thing in your mind? When I was, oh, I don't know, eight, my father told me that time that you enjoyed wasting is not wasted time. I've since learned that on that subject and many others, he was not quite right. But I think there's a germ of truth in that. I try not to waste time now, which doesn't mean I'm always working. But I am really trying a lot harder in the last few years to be intentional about how I'm wasting my time. I'm not really very good at it yet because I get easily distracted. You know, the, the dogs in, in Up, how they're always shouting squirrel. That's, that's kind of me. <laughs> but I really do try and say, okay, I'm going to spend some time today reading I'm going to spend some time today exercising. I'm going to spend some time today watching, yes, a movie that I've already seen before with my daughter, who also really enjoys it and has also seen it before because that's probably important. So I make all these plans. And then, of course, I'll just get distracted by a shiny object. But I'm getting better at it. And I really, I really do believe that it's important to be intentional about wasting time and that time that is intentionally wasted probably isn't wasted. And that is, that is something that's fairly new in my life. No, I, actually, I, I was just actually scribbling that down as a great quote. Then you were like, he's not right. I'm like, oh, no, I liked that one. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I'm going to keep it. <laughs> I still think it's a good quote. Yeah, it's like how you're on the Internet now and you, you have this great line. Oh, Albert Einstein said this. Uh, and then you go and you research it and you find out he didn't say that. Oh, in fact, right. he didn't even say anything close to that. And you're like, well, what are we going to do now? Darn internet. That was a great quote. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things that I've noticed as I get older is the ever accelerating speed of time that I perceive going by. Like the last three years have gone by roughly twice as fast as the preceding three years. And 
sometimes I can look back on the birth of one of my children as if it happened, you know, a day and a half ago, even though it's more than two decades sometimes. Are you also sensing or perceiving an acceleration in the, in the time that, that goes by? And if so, are you try, have you found any way to kind of arrest that or at least find some way to maybe grab on or slow down a little bit? You know, that's an interesting question because I have also felt this on the large scale about how fast time goes. But what's weird lately is I've felt like, wow, that was only six days ago that that happened. Um, one of the things I've started doing a lot, and this might be the cause of it, is I now write in my journal every night and I do a weekly review. And I will sit down at the end of the week and do my weekly review. And I'll look back over the last six days and I'm like, wait, that was this week? <laughs> that seems like it was forever ago. I, 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 there's this weird corollary. And Gary, I'd be really interested to know if you find the same thing. That when you look at the big events and wow, gosh, that seems like it was only yesterday, but it was five years ago. And then you look at the small and you say, wow. That was only three days ago, but it seems like three months. It's, that's really weird, and I had never noticed that before. Yeah, my experience is actually, I can use a word you just used, is I think if you're intentional, then I think you can actually slow time down, or the perception of time. If you're just, this sounds bad, if you're freewheeling through a day, it lasts about two hours. But if you're intentional, even if you're having fun being intentional, to your point, I think you get a lot more time. I think it's just a hack to tell your your brain is just more engaged if it's got like a, I don't know how to, how to explain it, but I know that I can just zone out and lose a half a day easy. I'm not saying you have to be busy all the time, but I do think that, I, I just think your word intentional is probably the perfect word. Because I, I think I read somewhere, a, a, a psychologist said, if I could boil all of my advice down to two words, he just used live consciously. Mm-hmm. I thought that was pretty good because if you're unconsciously kind of floating, it does just seem to zip right by. Yeah. Maybe it's the amount of stuff you, well, I don't know. I think that's a danger in saying the more stuff you can stuff into your day, the longer your life is, but yeah, you know, let's, be, yeah. let's, I don't even want to go down that hole. It, I, you, you mentioned journaling and I've actually met so many people in the last you know several months where that comes up in conversation. The two things I hear that come up in conversation constantly are journaling and meditation. Would you be willing to talk a little bit about how your journaling works, like how you approach it? Sure. As I was trying to think about what I do as a result of knowing that I'm going to die, that really is the thing that came up most is I have a journal. I write in it every day. Every day starts off with the day number that this is. So today is my 16,615th day, if I remember what I wrote down this morning. I got that from a book a long time ago called 20,000 Days and Counting. The book's okay. But the idea I thought was really interesting. A daily reminder of today is a day. It's a day that will never be repeated. It's a day that's never happened before. The days are numbered. And this one has the number of 16,608 or whatever it was. That's how it starts off every day. And then I have a series of prompts. And I try to, I don't always do it, but I try to have my journal broken out into morning. So before I leave for work, I'll do a series of prompts, uh, like three of them. What was the first thing I thought of when I woke up this morning? How will I make my day match my intention today? Three things I'm grateful for. And this year, I'm doing a goal of do the work every day. So I've identified three to five things that constitute that day's work. And I'll identify those things. And then I'll come back at night and I've got another set of prompts that I have to answer. One of them is, what things worked today? And I got that from A.J. Jacobs. He was talking about, we don't recognize how many things have to go right for us to just get through the day. And and so I'll list off, you know, eight or 10 of them. We had electricity. The microwave cooked my food, you know, things like that. (laughs) And then I'll have a prompt that I got I don't remember where. It's fairly new. The prompt is basically to document what happened today that made this day unique of all the other days that have happened in my life. 
And what I've found that that one does is it makes me think about the day and identify something that I learned. Uh, something that I didn't expect to happen or something that I did expect to happen, but that I learned something from it. And that's usually maybe two or three sentences, but that has become the biggest takeaway from my journaling. And really at the end of the week, I can look through there and list lessons from the week. You know, when you think about you are going to die, what are you going to do until then? At the moment for me, it's just let's gather up lessons and then see if we can apply them to make the finite time work better. And then I've got some other prompts, you know, what did you do today? What are you going to think about as you drift off to sleep tonight? And things like that. But having those template has been really good because it's, it gives me not a blank page to start from. And it sort of tells me unconsciously, these are the things you need to be watching for on this unique day that you're going to have. That's really cool. Now, did you actually just come up with all that yourself? Or did you like, is there, I know you said you got ideas from podcasts and the like, but like, are you looking at a blank piece of paper when you do that? Or do you have like a formatted journal for that? Oh, I do it in Evernote. Oh, okay. And uh, so every day is a, a different note. And I start them off to like 2018, 3, 28. And that way I can sort them. Gotcha. And then... I'll tag them. Like if something really interesting happens that I want to make sure and remember, I have a tag called remember this. So I can go back (laughs) and look at days that just floored me. And those are really interesting. The journal, this format has developed. I started journaling every day on January 30th, 2013. Wow. And I've, I've missed a few days since then, but Basically, that was when I started doing it for real. And the journal has changed dramatically as I've tried things and thrown away things and heard something on podcasts. And I have a friend who I ride bikes with uh, very often, and he started journaling, and he's way smarter than I am. So he would say, oh, you know what I learned last night about journaling? And I'm like, that's brilliant. That's kind of how it has developed. There's actually a cool lesson in there in that you're not rigidly kind of trying to stay inside of a single format you're actually evolving and changing i think it might makes it feel more organic and probably a little bit more free for you i would expect is that is that right yeah it is and i i've learned that the people you hear on the internet and whose book who write books they are people who are really good at saying things on the internet and writing books and i am not that person therefore the stuff that i'm reading that they're putting out about how well they run in their lives, those probably aren't going to work for me because I'm not that person. Yeah, I started off with a really rigid journal that I got from, I think it was Michael Hyatt gave me this format. And I tried to do this. And it just, it was a total disaster because he's like this uber super achiever and I'm like this slug. So it's important, I think, when you're getting advice to, you know, hold on to it pretty lightly and say, you know, this might not work for me. And usually it lasts about a week and a half. And, and then it, you find out, wow, this really doesn't work for me. And then it's time to move on to something else. So my journal has gone through thousands of iterations and will probably change before the end of the year this year. Yeah, but I still think that's, that's a good lesson. I still think that people get very hung up on something and then quit. And you're not quitting, you're just changing, which is yeah. great. I have a very important question that I've never asked anyone before. Oh, okay. <laughs> Tell me about the way you spell your name. <laughs> okay. I, I so can't my... ask anybody else because you'll know with that spelling. So I find it fascinating. That's why I ask. You know, it's a fabulous name because I get to tell this story about it. My name is Quinn and it's spelled K-W-I-N. And I get to tell people at networking events, oh, and I'm named after a radio station because my dad wanted to name all of his kids after radio stations. <laughs> and no one ever forgets that. At least nobody in the Western United States where that happens. Is that true? It is true. Oh, I thought he, you were like, it was like a, it was like a fake No, <laughs> no, that is absolutely 100% true. And he told me the story of being a 15-year-old working the overnight shift at the radio station and just trying to come up with people's names that could be radio stations. Names that start with a K for the Western U.S., <laughs> names that start with a W that are in the Eastern U.S., names that start with a C for Canada. 
And so, yeah, that's where my name comes from. And I actually have three siblings, and they're not named after radio stations. I think my mom put her foot down. I was about to ask that question. I was a little terrified to think of what your, if you had sisters, what they would be named. Oh, uh, I, I already know what they would be named because okay. my dad had the list. <laughs> I just, uh, I guess it's cool that Quinn worked and I would never, if you would give me a hundred guesses, I would never have come up with the story you just told <laughs> 200 guesses. Uh, I, I can't thank you enough, Quinn, for taking the time. And I think the one thing that's been amazing about this experience is that everybody that I talked to not only has been really giving and been very vulnerable about what they're doing, but there's just so much insight that we get from talking to everyone. And I just can't thank you enough for that. So thanks for your time. Oh, thank you, Jerry. It's been great. I'm so glad that you're doing this podcast. There is so much material here around the idea that we're we're not immortal and it, the implications of it are so great. And just getting ready for this podcast has prompted some great discussion in my family. So thank you. Thanks so much for listening to the Not Immortal Podcast. My name is Jerry Gerard. You can follow me on Twitter. I'm at, at Jerry Gerard. You can also follow the show at the website, notimmortal.com. You can also subscribe to us on iTunes, Overcast, and Stitcher, and Spotify, and all the other places you can get podcasts. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time. <laughs>